lot of you know I posted a um, thing about um, speaking on impressing God. Now how in the world do you actually impress God? Well, you know, a lot of people have their opinions. And I hear a lot of people talking, oh, so-and-so, man, they are famous. They've been on TV. That's not a real big deal anymore. <laughs> Everybody has their 15 mo minutes of fame on either TV or YouTube or whatever. Or so-and-so has got so much talent, they could, they, they, oh, it would just be wonderful if they would serve the Lord with it. Or that person has got so much money and, and oh, what they could do for the Lord with that money. And, and it's normal to think that, but that's not what impresses God. He doesn't look at you and see your talents, your money, your fame, and all of that, because he's the one that can give you all of that to start with. And so we're going to look at Matthew chapter 25 today at what God thinks about all of this, what Jesus has to say, not what we think. He said the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins, and that term can be used as bridesmaids in this particular situation. And it'll make a little more sense to, in today's language. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten bridesmaids, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. In the ancient Hebrew wedding, the wedding party, and particularly the bridesmaids, all had to have some form of lighting or torch with them to greet the bridegroom when he came, because lit, this is true, Anybody not having a torch or a light was looked upon as a wedding crasher in that day, and they didn't want them as part of that. So really nothing's new. If you've watched the movie Wedding Crashers, nothing is new because they did that 2,000 years ago. And so it was important that they had a light, and what they would use was either a torch like you see on the, you know, the, like the Frankenstein movies where they're surrounded with pitchforks and torches or whatever, and it's like an oily rack. But what they had, in, and, and they could use that, but most of them had an oil lamp that had a light on the end of it and had a little well of oil in it, and that's what they were using in this account that Jesus was talking about. He said five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, but took no oil with them. Now that really is foolish. You bring in a lamp and you don't have anything to keep it lit with. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. They carried extra oil with them. Because most of the time, the bridegroom did not get there when they thought he was, go when he was going to come. Now let's look at that from a spiritual sense here. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, and that was the return of the bridegroom, and the return of Jesus will be like that as well. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And the moral of that story is you've got to be ready at any time when the Lord comes for you individually or he comes for the church. Because once that happens, there is no second chance at that. Then all the bridegrooms arose and trimmed their lamps and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered and said, not so lest there be not enough for us and you. But go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. You need to get it for yourself. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready, listen carefully, went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. Once Jesus returns for his church, 
the door is going to be shut. And I know a lot of people said, oh, I'll just wait and get saved at a later time. It's not going to happen. And don't fool yourself with that. And afterward came also the other bridesmaids calling, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, truly I say unto you, I don't know you. Wow. What a, that's probably the most awful thing that anybody could ever hear Jesus say to them is I don't know you. So watch therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So first of all, to do anything with the Lord, you've got to be born again. That's been the message all through the Bible. You must be born again. And the oil is the same as the Holy Spirit. And if you do not have him, you are lost. If the Holy Spirit is not living within you, you are lost. You may be a church member. You may be this or you may be that. But you are lost if the Holy Spirit is not living within within you he is your light that's why they use that expression about the oil in there the holy spirit is your light that illuminates you he leads you he guides you he teaches you and he convicts you when you've done wrong any and listen carefully to this because there's a growing number of those today all over the world and in churches anyone who lives a life of sin and has no conviction for it, no sorrow for it, no repentance, does not have the Holy Spirit living within them. You have been fooled by Satan and you are fooling yourselves. If you are living a life of sin outside of God's word, outside of God's will, and you have no feeling about that, and it doesn't bother you, and you don't feel convicted, and he's not knocking on your heart's door, you were never there to start with. And so it is important that no matter how long maybe you've been a church member, or how long you've done this, or how long you've done that, if those things are lacking in your life, you need to be born again. You need to be saved. Let's look at the second one here. He gives several examples. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. And he called his servants and he delivered unto them his goods. Jesus went back to the Father. And he has given us gifts while we're waiting for him to return. And to one, he gave five talents. Talent is a measure of money. Matter of fact, it's quite a bit. To another, he gave two talents, and to another, and, and to another one, one. And to every man according to his ability, and straightway took his journey. God will give you things according to what he feels he can trust you with. You understand what I'm saying? And then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made five more talents. He used what God gave him. He used what his master gave him and doubled. Likewise, he that had received two, he gained also another two. But he that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. Matter of fact, that's $5,280, one talent. So that's a lot of money, isn't it? After a long time, the Lord of those servants comes and checked with them or reckoned with them to see what they had done with what he had given them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought the other five talents and said, Lord, you delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I've gained, five beside, I've gained beside them five talents more. And there will come a time when the Lord will reckon with each and every one of us to see what we have done with what he has blessed us with and what he has given us. 
What have we done with it? And everybody in here has a measure of that. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter now into the joy of your Lord. Wow. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered unto me two talents. Behold, I've gained two more beside them. And the Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. It doesn't matter how many he gave. If you were faithful with it, he rewarded you with way more than what you originally had. Then he that had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I know that you are a hard man, reaping where you've not sown and gathering where you've not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid the talent in the earth. And here's what you have, here's what you've given me. I'm giving it back to you. One talent. That's all he had to do was use that one talent for the Lord. His Lord answered and said unto him, you wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I sowed not and gathered where I've not strawed. You ought to therefore have taken, put my money to the exchanger and then at my coming I would have received my own with interest. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten. For unto every one that hath shall be given and every one that and he shall have abundance, and from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast that unprofitable servant into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I want everybody to understand that God gives you gifts when you get saved. Everybody in here, not just some talent that you're born with, but a gift to use what may be whatever talent you're born with. He gives you gifts. He gives you, first of all, the gift of faith enough to be saved. Then he gives you talents and abilities, and some of them are supernatural. He gave you those talents to spread the gospel and to lift up the body of Christ. You are not to neglect it by no means. You're not to hide it and you're not to misuse that gift. You see a lot of people on TV misusing what they claim is a gift from God and I wonder if they ever got it to make money. I don't believe he got it to start with. God is patient. I want you to understand that. Thank God he is. <laughs> Thank God that God is patient. How about that? But there will come a time that if you neglect it, if you misuse it, or if you hide it, you won't be able to use it anymore. And that is a sad thing indeed to be shelved and not have that, even have that gift to use for God because you refused to use it. And so I would say to everyone, use what he has given you now. Don't wait. Use the gifts that he has given you. Now, here's the next one. You want to know what impresses God, we're going to look at it. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And, there, and, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats will be on his left. Then shall the king say to them on his right hand, listen carefully, Come ye blessed of my father, and hurt the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. 
Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you or thirsty and gave you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and took you in or naked and clothed you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and came unto you? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Truly, I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it unto me. When you give, when you do these things, you are literally giving it to the Lord himself. Then he will say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't take me in naked, and you clothed me not, sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto you? Then he shall answer them, Truly I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. This is not a popular thing to say, but it is biblical. But it is the job of the church to take care of the widows and the orphans, the downcast and the poor. It is the job of the church to visit the sick and the prisoners. That's the job that the state does now. And what a lovely job they do of that. They are the most biggest money wasters in all of all people when it is the job of the church to do these things. Now, I will admit that these things are the most thankless and unappreciated ministries in all of Christianity, but if it's done right, there is no limelight. There is no admiration and no attention, but it is the heartbeat of every church, or it should be. I thank God that I am part of a church that does that. I am not saying that to brag, but I want to showcase that as an example of what it is supposed to be like. If we want to be a real New Testament church, we need to do what the New Testament church did and listen to the words of Jesus. So many of the big, huge churches, they got it right on salvation. They got it right on their eschatology. They got it right on their soteriology. They got it right on all the ologies. But how are they? On the homeless, the poor, the widow, and the orphans, and the elderly. I stuck that in there for me. <laughs> you approach a lot of these big churches and they'll go, "We." this is the standard quote, we have nothing in our budget for that. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You better get something in your budget for that. It takes most of our budget to do that. But that's what God commanded. And because of that, he has sustained us. And he will continue to sustain us as long as we do this work for him. You know what impresses God? People that will drive for hours to clothe the naked in Appalachia, to feed the hungry in our neighborhood. That's what impresses God. He sees that, and because of that, he blesses this church. And most all of y'all that do this kind of work has got so many physical ailments and things wrong with y'all that you ought to be in a hospital somewhere instead of working here, but you show up every day, thank God, and he sustains you while you are doing that. And I'm going to tell you, no matter what news you hear from the doctor, he will sustain you for as long as you are doing his work. That is a fact and you will never lack for anything.
because you are doing the work of God. Taking care of the poor, praying for the poor, praying for the sick, visiting them, encouraging them, all of those things. What the New Testament church is supposed to be about. And that is a big way to spread the gospel to everybody because it's like uh, many centuries ago, there was a man that gave his life for the Indians up in the northern part of America gave his life for it, finally died of a fever from exposure, but he spent his life ministering to the Indians. And one of the Indians said, many people talk about Jesus, but he lives Jesus. And that's what will win somebody. Not what you're saying, but what you do and the way you live and the heart that you have for them. That's how you reach people. And we need to continue to do it. Finally, the next thing is you have got to have not only faith, but I said this nearly 20 some years ago in a message, you have gotta have combat faith. What is combat faith? Faith that shines even in the middle of a storm. I'm a, I, it's easy for us to talk that stuff when we're sitting up on top of a mountain, isn't it? It is, let's just be honest. It's easy to be thankful, it's easy to be excited when we're sitting up on top of the mountain, but you know what, the time of sitting up on top of the mountain is very rare. We're usually in a valley, and if you're not in one, you're getting ready to go in one, or either you're coming out of one. I mean, I'm not saying that to sound negative, but that's the way the Christian life is. We're in a battle all the time, fighting all the time. And so you got to have what is called combat faith if you're going to do it. And the greatest example of combat faith was from a Roman soldier of all things. In Matthew chapter 8, it said in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 5, when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, that's a Roman soldier who is in charge of a hundred soldiers, beseeching Jesus, saying, Lord, my servant lies at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented, he was paralyzed. And Jesus said to him, well, I will come and heal him. And the centurion answered and said, Lord, oh, listen to this man, listen to this. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. I'm not even worthy for you to visit my home. But speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man with authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, come, and another one, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he does that. In other words, Lord, I understand what authority is, and I'm acknowledging that you got it. And that Jesus still has the same authority that he had when he walked this earth 2,000 years ago. He still has the same power. And he can heal. He can do all of the things that he did while he was on this earth. But we have to acknowledge that. And quit letting people buffalo us into thinking that God don't do miracles anymore. And that God don't do this and God don't do that. Show me in the Bible where he stopped and I'll sit down and shut up. And I know for a fact you can't show me, so I'm going to keep talking. And so he said that to Jesus. Here's a Roman soldier. Never was brought up as a Jew. He didn't know things about scriptures and he didn't know all of his ologies and all of those things. He didn't have a seminary degree yet. But he said, Lord, you say the word and it'll be taken care of. Now this was one instance in the Bible where Jesus himself was impressed. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. In other words, he stood in admiration of that Roman soldier. He was literally surprised he was literally oh my goodness he was impressed 
And one of the gospels says he turned him about and looked at everybody and it said, he said to them that followed, truly I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. A Roman centurion had more faith than anybody at that time in the nation of Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He told that centurion, go your way as you have believed, so be it done unto you. And his servant was healed that selfsame hour. In the days ahead before the Lord comes to get us, you're going to have to exercise combat faith. If you want to do the things that get the attention of the Lord to where he'll tell you one day, well done thou good and faithful servant, you use the talent that he has given you. Use it for him in the way he wants you to use it. Believe that he can do what he says he can do and don't ever be afraid of what anybody or anything can try to harm you. Don't be afraid of that because he is going to keep you safe. He's going to sustain you while you are doing his work. He's given you talents. He's given you abilities. It's time that you use them for his glory. Don't hide it. Don't neglect it. Don't misuse it. Use it for him. You know what? He may give you a couple more. God will bless you for obeying him. That's what impresses God is faith and obedience, not the flamboyance of, uh, 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 of what you have in your life. If you're, if you're wealthy and healthy and wise, thank God for it, but you better use that for his glory and not for yours. That's the way that the kingdom of God works. It never works on paper. Nothing that has ever been accomplished for God, particularly in this congregation, has ever worked out on paper. So if you're going to sit down with a pencil and a paper and try to figure out if you can do it, you might as well ball it up and throw that in the trash can because it'll never show up. It'll say, no, 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 you can't do it. But the word Cain is not in God's vocabulary. It's only in man's. And, he is, and the sky is the limit, folks. I want you to understand there is, don't look at yourself. Don't, don't look, get the mirror out of your house if you're going to do something for God because you look at that mirror and go, oh Lord, ain't no way in the world I can do something for the Lord like this. Yes, you can. He will use the most unlikely people. I've watched it in the 30 years that I've pastored this church. He always calls on the unlikely. If you think that, oh, well, I got the talent, man. I can do a whole lot for the Lord. Uh, he may not call you at all because you're just plumb arrogant. Just know that you're nothing without him and that you can be everything with him and let him take control of your life and he'll do that. Shall we stand?